Our third panel today uh, is going to be moderated by our discussant, uh, Margaret Malone, former staff director of the Social Security Advisory Board. Uh, please join me in welcoming Margaret. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin today by congratulating Congressman McCreary and Pomeroy for leading this effort to respond to the very critical problems that are threatening the future of the disability insurance program. The conference being held here today is ample evidence of the seriousness of their effort. The papers that I'm commenting on today address a number of important issues among the many that the Social Security disability system faces today and unfortunately that it has been facing for many years, decades in the past. In my many years of observation and participation, it's been clear that Social Security does not embrace change readily. I believe that unless clear priorities are chosen, we will again fall into the fatal trap of talking about change, but not making the earnest and sustained effort that needs to be made to bring it about. Our first paper for this panel is by John Dubin. It's a well-researched and well-argued paper proposing ending the reconsideration stage of SSDI adjudication. John? Thank you, Margaret. Oh, I have a mic here. Uh, I'm going to take this down, if I may. Okay, well, let me start by uh, describing, as you know, there is a, a four-stage administrative process for adjudicating claims under the, the SSI and, and the SSDI and SSI programs. Of the over four million claims that are adjudicated each year, and you can see that from my uh, waterfall chart there, over three and a half million are processed at the first two stages of adjudication. The initial and the reconsideration stages of review, they're then followed by an ALJ hearing stage and then an administrative appeal stage before the Appeals Council. Now there have been many studies and critiques of the agency's adjudication process since the late 70s to the present from bodies like the Administrative Conference of the U.S., the General Accounting Office, the National Center for Administrative Justice, the Social Security Advisory Board and countless scholars, and a continuing and common critique in those studies is the process simply takes too long, and the initial stages, which as you can also see from the waterfall chart uh, where most of decision making occurs, um, they often do not effectively develop a sufficient record of the claimant's disabilities, disabilities which are often revealed at later stages in the process uh, with fuller record development. So my proposal is addressed to this basic, fundamental, and well-acknowledged problem. It calls for eliminating entirely the second reconsideration stage to streamline the adjudicative process and then bolstering the initial stage by attempting to develop records at the initial stage that are a lot closer to what's developed at the hearing stage. And I should say at the outset, this is not, uh, as Margaret alluded to, it's not a a, a new or, or novel idea. The agency itself has been testing elimination of the reconsideration stage uh, for the past 16 years along with some modifications of the initial stage. And although it's not a new idea, my thought was if there's going to be meaningful uh, SSDI adjudicative reform as part of what's being done in 2016, then heeding the numerous and multi-decade calls to develop fuller and more accurate records earlier in the process and shedding less valuable layers of time-consuming bureaucracy should also be on the table and part of this conversation and discussion. So to summarize my proposal's thesis in my remaining uh, limited time, let me lay out a series of uh, assertions which I can perhaps explore in greater detail uh, on questioning. That's first, in the initial stage, uh, the State Disability Agency, the DDS, develops the case by seeking medical records from hospitals and treating sources, arranging for consultative evaluations if needed, and then a two-person team of disability examiner and medical consultant makes the final decision. There's no subpoenaing of evidence from treating sources. There's only limited efforts to obtain assessments of medical findings from treatings which are components of uh, 
automatically disabling listings or which reveal assessments of specific functional restrictions, which are part of the necessary residual functional capacity assessments. Consultative evaluations, when ordered, are done almost exclusively by non-treating doctors without familiarity with the claimant. Credible vocational ev evidence is not generally sought when claims cannot be decided based solely on either return to work or on the medical vocational grid regulations. And the claimant has little opportunity to be informed of perceived deficiencies in his or her case or address missing or potentially confusing or conflictual material in the application. My second assertion is that the reconsideration stage is largely repeated. The initial application stage takes approximately the same amount of time to usually reach the same result as the initial stage, add, adding another 108 days to the process. It's not calculated in its present form to uh, produce records which are meaningfully more developed than those at the initial application stage, and its relatively low reversal rate of only about 11% has led many scholarly, scholarly commentators and bodies to reference it as uh, largely a repeat of the initial stage or, or even the pejorative rubber stamp. Third, and let me see if I can go to another slide here, uh, for the past 16 years, the agency has been testing in 10 prototype states, as I mentioned, the elimination of reconsideration with some modifications of the initial stage that are described in my slide, the use of a single decision maker, authorizing a single disability examiner to make a decision without the additional time required to do so in two-person teams, unless necessary, and some selective conferencing with claimants although this last conferencing aspect was uh, dropped in 2002 and replaced with informal uh, phone contacts. I should say that this test uh, originally was supposed to go national no later than 2003, uh, but instead has simply continued in limited form for another, I guess, what is this, 14 uh, or so years. Fourth, uh, the agency's public pronouncements have largely lauded the prototype's uh, results from the standpoint of reducing delays, developing more complete and accurate records earlier in the process, improving overall decisional accuracy, and increasing user satisfaction. You can see some quotes from the 2001 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking uh, extending the, uh, the prototype here. Um, there were also comments uh, that speak to the enhanced bureaucratic value of being able to divert agency resources from the reconsideration stage to other stages of the adjudicative process to, bet to make better and quicker decisions. Um, and I have, oh wait, another slide on that. Uh, fifth, uh, the principal reasons offered by the agency for not implementing a proposal to take the reconsideration elimination prototype national has been a concern that the removal of this reconsideration stage filter has produced a greater appeal to hearing rate from initially denied claims. And this, in turn, has produced more benefit awards uh, from more successful appeals at the hearing stage, which is uh, an increased cost. You can see that in this uh, administrative letter, which describes it in uh, 2001. It's also produced more pressure on the hearing process. And with respect to the pressure and cost on the hearing process, my uh, later slides uh, reference uh, Inspector General O'Carroll's uh, testimony about the value of diversion of administrative resources from the elimination of reconsideration to the hearing stage to address that concern. He noted that in Michigan alone, diversion of administrative resources from reconsideration elimination could support the processing of an additional 17,600 hearings per year. Sixth, it's my paper's assertion that uh, uh, if a principal justification for retaining the reconsideration stage is resort to the stage as a filter to winnow out or discourage claimants with otherwise meritorious claims, from proceeding to success at the hearing stage and the resultant savings and costs from not paying benefits on those otherwise meritorious claims, that this is not a sufficient public policy justification for continuation of this bureaucratic step. Um, apart from possibly hindering what might be a particularly fragile and vulnerable subset of claimants, um, from eligibility, such a result is really anathema to the Act's purpose in history to create a user-friendly system 
to serve all eligible workers who paid into the system for so long with the expectation of insurance coverage when disability occurs. Seventh and finally, I've outlined additional measures uh, in my last two slides here uh, put up that I believe will further result in better developed initial stage records and render those stages closer to the hearing stage records and result in um, decisions more rapidly. They include, uh, at least my first two, really uh, focus on meeting the statutory and regulatory mandate of pursuing all reasonable measures to obtain relevant evidence from the claimant's treating physicians, even before other medical evidence, something which occurs at a much greater rate at the hearing stages than at the initial and reconsideration stages, which includes requests to treating sources to assess functional limitations relevant to the RFC assessment at steps four and five of the subsequent of the substantive sequential evaluation process and also evidence about the presence or absence of elements of medical listings or their equivalent at step three of that process. Other recommendations include using vocational sources for step five vocational determinations in cases that cannot be decided with uh, the medical vocational grid regulations alone. And on the vocational evidence side, I've included a sub-recommendation to supplement the agency's current occupational information system project designed, which is designed to uh, replace the Dictionary of Occupational Titles with a new occupational taxonomy. I've also recommended creation of a numerical and locational occupational database to support step five determinations, which requires evidence of work which exists in significant numbers in the claimant's region or several regions, and therefore simply replacing or updating the Dictionary of Occupational Titles is not, a, is not enough. I've also recommended identifying and providing assistance to mentally and language challenged claimants earlier in the process through interpreters and staff to avert barriers based on language or cognitive or psychological obstacles, and fifth, uh, publication of quality standards for uh, consultative exams and enforcement of those standards. I think I'm about over my time, so why don't I stop now and follow up with further questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now we'll hear from Dale Glendenning, who with his colleagues is proposing a very significant change in the hearing office procedure. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good afternoon. Peace be with you. Um, I'm honored and pleased to be here. Uh, this is a distinct privilege for me, being an administrative law judge, and I'm grateful uh, to uh, the committee for selecting the papers that are the paper that uh, Judges Wolf and Engel and I have drafted. And uh, during the next few minutes, I hope to give you an overview of that. Let's see. Notwithstanding the fact that uh, the words are ours and uh, the uh, words of my mouth are mine and the meditations of our hearts are the authors, uh, we disclaim that we're speaking for the Social Security Administration and I hope you realize that. I bring you cheers and best wishes from my colleagues uh, Jeff and Dave. Uh, they said to tell you that uh, had they not been having hearings previously scheduled, they would have been here. I did not, so I'm here. Uh, I'd also like to express my gratitude, uh, Commissioner Colvin, uh, ODAR Management, uh, the Office of the Chief Judge, uh, for uh, consenting to our participation in this outside activity, which we're required to do as administrative law judges in the Social Security Administration. I also thank the committee. What a, what a marvelous group of young men and women uh, to put on a conference like this to bring so many talented, smart people together with ideas to be shared. And of course, uh, Congressman McCreary and Pomeroy, I really appreciate them because they have given this committee support and brought this thing to, to fruition. Um, Yesterday evening, I got an advanced copy of what's been handed out here. I know Mike Murphy would not know how that's done. And, you know, he said, well, how do that? And I said, well, prepare for hearings. I actually read the record. So I realized that in your uh, booklet, 
uh, it doesn't give uh, background information about Judges Engel, Wolf, and Glendening. I would like to take hopefully less than 60 seconds to do that, and I'm going to use a slide to do it. Judge Engel has various degrees, including a Master of Public Administration as well as a Master of Laws. He's a member of the Virginia Bar. He's been an administrative law judge since 1997, and he's actually the hearing office chief judge in the Tulsa Office of Disability Adjudication and Review. And he served for a number of years as Associate General Counsel, Department of Veterans Affairs, and as a, he is currently an adjunct professor at the uh, University of Tulsa College of Law. Uh, many of you in here are familiar with uh, Jeff Wolf. Uh, Jeff also uh, has a, a, a Master of Law degrees. He's a member of the California and uh, Oklahoma Bar. He's a former magistrate judge, and he's been a Social Security Administrative Law Judge since uh, 1995, and he's written numerous articles. Uh, he is indeed a scholar about Social Security issues, uh, and uh, he's uh, also uh, an adjunct professor at the uh, College of Law, uh, University of Tulsa. What is that? That is not me, but that is me, okay. And, and I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm a member of the North Carolina and Florida bars. I was a street person when I was appointed in 1991. I'd practiced law for about 15 years and the focus of my law was in civil practice and I did government law, I did federal school law, and I did poverty law. I was director of a legal aid program for three years. And uh, I uh, had an active duty as a regular Army officer and also an uh, Army officer in the United States Army Reserve. And I've had the privilege of working with Jeff on various projects. The topic that was selected by the committee for us to report on, which was refined, was restructuring disability adjudication. And actually, we have five proposals that's in our paper, and I'd like to briefly give you an overview of those. Uh, I will not be getting down in the weeds because of time, but of course, uh, you can ask your questions, and if time permits and it's appropriate that I can answer it, I'll be glad to try to do so. We have five proposals that we believe would positively affect the disability hearing process. The first one is inclusion of the Social Security Administration as a present party. We call it PREP-P, acronym, government works, uh, in the disability appeals process. The second is the adoption of formal rules of practice and procedure. Third one, restructuring the scope of the Appeals Council review. The fourth one, replacing the pay for delay attorney fee uh, system that's in place, and the fifth one, ending representation travel reimbursements. With regard to the PREP-P, we acknowledge that this is indeed a controversial topic. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, we understand that there was a project uh, that uh, was uh, attempted back in the 80s, I guess, perhaps in the early 90s, and that was uh, not adopted by the administration. Uh, we envision the Social Security Administration as being a present party in the disability reviews. By present party, we mean a real live person, uh, a representative or uh, ideally an attorney operating out of the Office of General Counsel, uh, employed for purpose of representing the agency in disability proceedings before an administrative law judge. There is one big, giant, critical reason for doing this, and the reason is that the PREP P roles is to promote administrative justice for all parties in a disability proceeding. The PREP P's mission purpose is to advocate for correct and timely results, urging the granting of benefits uh, as the uh, evidentiary record would support, or as necessary, appealing a judge's decision uh, as may be appropriate. And in any given appeal, the claimant might find in the present party an ally or a skeptic, but one who is nevertheless uh, bound to inquire, uh, having uh, inherited that duty of inquiry from the administrative law judge, 
and an exercise in the duty to ensure that the correct result uh, is achieved under the Social Security Act. If you were to give a survey to administrative law judges in the Social Security Administration and give them some options as to things that they would like to see, I dare say pretty close to the top, if not the top, is the next proposal, namely formal rules of procedure. We're rec oh, what did I do? Yeah. We're recommending that uh, the agency uh, implement some formal rules to govern the uh, whole disability process, unlike the federal rules of civil procedure that apply uh, in uh, civil proceedings in the courts, and unlike other federal agencies that have rules, Social Security really doesn't have any kind of rules. It's quite an adventure for those of us who are educated in the law and have practice in judicial and administrative forums, and you go in and you realize, well, there's really not uh, things uh, uh, that really govern how you're conducting that hearing. And I'd like to state that the uh, I tend to believe, my opinion is, that our hearings tend to be less efficient and more costly by not having formal rules to move a case along uh, in a reasonable manner. Also, I note that all too often, uh, judges and the support staff tend to carry the weight and be blamed for uh, untimely movement of cases uh, and the backlog. Uh, when, in effect, they're working within a system in which there really isn't any kind of governing time limits that require things to be moved along. Judges who adjudicate in our current environment realize, among other things, that for purpose of making a decision, first of all, the record never closes, and it doesn't, because evidence can be submitted to the Appeals Council, and if I affirm the case or the Appeals Council remands it, I can see the same case uh, six months later with the new evidence in the file. The second thing is uh, that there's really no standard for submission of evidence, which is really a bummer because you ought to see some of the things that come through the electronic folder that are disorganized, that you can't read, uh, that are illegible and nonsensical in some situations. And finally, there's really no impetus because we have no rules to move a case along. With regard to the formal rules of procedure, we think that we should have rules governing the hearing process as well as evidentiary standards. We want rules for pre-hearing uh, case management purposes. We want rules for discovery and case development. We also would like rules to apply to early agreed resolution before a hearing, which could be done with the PrEP P and the representative of a claimant when a case should be brought before a judge because a resolution can be had in a timely manner. We would like rules for agreed resolution after a hearing. And finally, above all, we'd like some rules to close the record after a hearing. Our proposal on appeals council reform is tied into an article that was written in 1987, published by ACUS. And in that article, uh, the Appeals Council, they recommended that the Appeals Council should significantly reduce its role in reviewing appeals from decision by administrative law judges. Why? Because a disability appeal before the Appeals Council, are there, the decisions have no precedential value, and significantly delay arises from remands that do not implicate law regulation or policy. The standard on appeal, we believe, should be that the appeals may be taken where there is a significant showing that the decision implicates significant public policy or statutory, regulatory, and or legal construction affecting the disability program. Appeals should not be made for a disagreement on what the basis of facts are because if, in fact, the Appeals Council follows the models of other appeals uh, courts, uh, then they should be looking at uh, an error in law as opposed to the findings of facts. With regard to attorney's fees, an overriding question isn't, sorry about payment, I missed that, that's one word I didn't, anyway. 
this is beyond the scope of this paper, but the question is, and we talk about this, why is the agency involved in paying fees? Attorney's fees, representative fees. And of course, people will have different uh, views on that, the right way or wrong way, but it's beyond the scope of our paper, but it's something for everybody to take back and consider at this point in time. With regard for uh, the pay for delay concept, the question is, and this is a little comic release that Judge Wolf always puts in his slides, by the way. No, Bob, we charge legal fees, we do not plunder. Okay, what should change? Okay, the current fee system increases the attorney, uh, the attorney's fees, the longer uh, the wait for a hearing, thus incentivizing delay. And the current system places the interest of the attorney in front of the claimant. The solution? Reverse the incentive so that a greater fee is awarded based upon how quickly an appeal is made ready. Alternatively, establish a flat fee and give the ALJ limited discretion to increase the fee based on complexity and or timely hearing. The other proposal that we have is that uh, the question is, why does Social Security lawyers and disability advocates travel around the country when disability lawyers and representatives can be find, found virtually in every state and every city in the United States? And the answer, SSA should not be making uh, these payments. Uh, it's no longer 1956 and more than 80% uh, of the claimants are now represented. And you can hear anecdotal stories about uh, claimants and attorneys meeting for the first time outside of a hearing five minutes before the hearing. I attest to that. That happens, and it happens all too frequently. Social Security has not altered its adjudicatory model for more than 50 years. And given the shortcomings of earlier solutions, the persistent and growing hearings pending backlog augurs for change. I suggest to you that now is the time for us to act. Action will change things. Change is needed, if not now, when? I'm hopeful that this initiative and its end product uh, will be a spark and a guide in the ongoing dialogue about reforming social security disability. And I believe with respectful and open-minded collaboration, everyone at this conference, those who are not at this conference, who have the authority and are influential, can in fact make a difference and will going forward. And I implore you and ask you to commit, please, uh, to reforming Social Security Disability Program that has benefited so many people over the years and would hopefully continue to benefit people and we can change the administration of this program. Thank you. Our third speaker is Alex Constantine, who with colleagues at NIH is proposing important changes to improve the CDR process and in fact the entire decisional process. Hi, um, I would like to begin by um, acknowledging my co-authors, um, Julia Porcino, John Collins, and Xun Zhao Zhu. Um, so the SSA disability beneficiaries are subject to continuing disability reviews uh, to determine whether they still meet the medical requir eligibility requirements to stay in the program. Um, the frequency of the reviews depends on the beneficiary's likelihood of medical improvement. So at the time when SSA decides that someone is disabled or continues to be disabled, they set a medical diary um, that um, places beneficiaries into three categories, medical improvement expected, possible or not expected, and SSA intends to review these cases every 18 months, um, three years, and seven years, respectively. Um, SSA performs uh, two types of CDRs, mailers and full medical reviews. Um, mailers are just um, short forms that are sent to beneficiaries, um, asking them if their condition has improved or deteriorated. 
And um, a full medical reviews involve the uh, full uh, development of the um, medical history of a beneficiary for the past 12 months by SSA. Um, so um, these, these latter reviews are a lot costlier. Um, SSA uses a CDR predictive model to determine whether a beneficiary should be sent a mailer or undergo the full medical review. Um, and this model uses um, program variables such as age, impairment, um, time and disability status, and other variables to estimate the likelihood of cessation where a full medical um, CDR to be performed. But despite the use of this model, only 5 to 6 percent of full medical reviews end in cessation of benefits. Um, still, the process is very cost effective, um, resulting in a $10, spent for, um, a $10 saved for every $1 spent on CDRs. Um, Currently, the CDR backlog contains about 1.3 million cases, um, and SSA cited resource limitations as the main reason for falling behind on uh, these CDRs. Um, an OIG report estimated that um, this backlog resulted in overpayments of one to three billion dollars. Um, the most significant limitations of both the CDR predictive model and the CDR process in general stem from um, the, the lack of access, use, and acquisition of relevant medical data at the right time that can be used for decision making. And also um, in the use of inefficient electronic business processes that still mimic um, some of the older paper-based processes and don't take full advantage of um, automatic data entry and collection of information that gets generated throughout the adjudication process. Um, so um, we propose four main strategies for um, removing these limitations and improving the CDR process. Um, these strategies are linked, uh, they support each other, um, and each of them is a massive undertaking, but they can be implemented in small incremental steps that can result in incremental benefits to the uh, program. Um, so um, first of all, we propose um, um, investment in new data acquisition efforts. So currently the data that goes into the CDR predictive model um, to, to estimate whether uh, someone's likelihood of cessation can be seven or uh, seven years old or even older. Um, and with uh, the limited use of um, some CMS data, um, SSA doesn't collect medical evidence in between reviews. Um, so we propose the acquisition of um, various types of data with um, very limited use of SSA staff resources that can be used in data analytics and predictive modeling to improve the accuracy of the CDR predictive model. Um, these are acquisition of periodic um, work disability uh, functional assessment battery scores or FAB scores. Um, the FAB is an instrument for um, precisely measuring functional abilities that was funded by SSA and is currently being implemented and developed by Boston University and um, NIH. And it can me uh, measure um, functional capacity across the full continuum of human functioning in areas such as mobility, cognition, interpersonal interaction, communication, self-care, um, and general tasks and demands. Um, it can be very easily administered online and over the phone, um, at, and um, it can be administered at different times throughout the adjudication process. Um, we also propose the development of a web-based application where uh, beneficiaries and their representatives can um, have access to their information and can upload new medical evidence as it becomes available. Um, this medical evidence can be used um, when determining uh, whether to perform a full medical review, and um, it can also save some of the effort in developing a full case um, when the full medical review is done. Um, we also propose using automatic collection and leveraging of electronic medical records, such as CMS and Medicaid data and data from other insurers and uh, pharmacies. Um, secondly, we propose using data analytics and predictive modeling um, 
to improve aspects of the CDR model. Um, we propose using text mining and natural language processing to um, improve medical diary designations. Um, these designations were um, set in the 1990s. They follow a simple set of rules that was based on um, SSA data and on medical literature reviews, and they haven't been updated since. Um, so using um, text mining and predictive modeling uh, to improve these rules could result in a finer grained um, better uh, diary designation. And with enough data, such as the FAB uh, functional scores, um, it could even result in a predictive model for the medical diary designation with finer grained categories that would serve as an important variable in the CDR predictive model and improve the accuracy of that model without making any changes to it. Um, we also propose using um, this data such as FAB scores to set individualized diary dates to make sure that um, each beneficiary is reviewed at uh, the exact right time. And using this data to check for adherence to prescribed treatment and identify beneficiaries who um, are not following treatment but whose function might um, improve from treatment and provide them with additional support that might um, help them regain function and go back to work. Um, thirdly, we propose using a dynamic prioritization queue for processing CDR cases under funding constraints. So we propose creating a queue based on the expected lifetime savings and uh, probability of uh, cessation and um, actually adjudicating, uh, review, reviewing cases in the exact order of the queue. Um, the queue could be used to inform yearly CDR funding decisions and to reprior uh, the queue can be reprioritized um, in light of new information that becomes available or is provided by the claimants. Um, um, making sure that cases are reviewed in this order would result in the most efficient use of limited CDR dollars. Um, in order to make it possible um, to use data for decision making and to use data, analytic, uh, data analytics efficiently, um, it's, um, it's necessary for SSA to invest in information technology for data acquisition, access, consistency, and integrity. So um, these efforts would be more cost effective if they were coupled with a, a data modernization and integration effort through an agency level enterprise data environment, a modular integrated environment for accessing all SSA data related to a claimant, um, and also accessing unstructured information such as electronic health records um, and uh, scanned medical records um, the, um, in their native format. And for, for this to be possible, it has to be coupled with IT infrastructure modernization that would support the creation of this environment. Um, so um, all of the measures we proposed um, with proper implementation and proper testing um, should be able to result in significant um, increases in productivity and consistency of the entire SSA adjudication process and not just the CDR process. And they should allow for more cases to be eliminated from the backlog um, while eliminating repetition and rework. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, the first paper we had today by John Dubin regarding the elimination of reconsideration reminds us of arguments that uh, have been made since at least the 1990s, and yet the agency has kept testing and maintaining uncertainty as to the future. I'm sympathetic to his proposal to end reconsideration and agree with many of the points he made about improving the front end. In fact, I would suggest that before reconsideration is eliminated, SSA, the administration, and the Congress should work to agree on priorities for change in order to forestall any negative outcome that might follow elimination. 
Ending Greek consideration would be less likely to face negative consequences if the initial decision stage would first be made stronger. I think it's within the agency's power to do this and that making the following changes should be a high priority. First, by undertaking a vigorous, ongoing national training program for DDS staff in all states that would improve the quality, consistency, and the fairness of decision-making throughout the country. Second, by setting standards and providing ongoing training for all medical and vocational experts and medical consultants. Third, by working to improve the quality of written decisions so that claimants will understand the bases for the negative decisions that they receive and judges will understand the reasoning of the DDS decision maker. I recall that when I was serving as special advisor to the Commissioner of Disability, I asked the quality office to share with me a random sample of DDS denial notices provided uh, that had been sent to claimants. Almost universally, these notices provided no rationale that might persuade the claimant that the case had been carefully examined and considered. No wonder the claimant chooses to appeal. Fourth, give decision makers the tools they need to make sound decisions. As John mentioned, uh, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles needs to be uh, improved and brought up to date to reflect current employment conditions. Uh, this is an improvement that SSA has worked on for a good number of years, and it's past time to bring this effort to fruition. Fifth, by requiring SSA's reviewers and analysts to make full use of the agency's policy feedback system to identify and correct errors in decision making, both allowances and denials. In sum, by improving the first level of decision making, I think we can acquire the positive information needed to convince policymakers and participants in the process that reconsideration can safely be eliminated. And that, I believe, will be the time to make the change. Administrative law judges Engel, Glendening, and Wolf have also proposed a change that is worthy of consideration. They propose that each hearing office have what they refer to as a referee or prep, whose role would be to promote administrative justice for all parties in a disability proceeding. This proposal builds on proposals that have been made in the past, which called for an establishing an adversarial process in the hearing office. There is merit in this proposal, but I believe it raises issues that need to be resolved. I would suggest that SSA solicit and analyze the views of judges and hearing office attorneys throughout the country. This could be done by holding regional meetings, holding tele teleconferences, and perhaps by soliciting written views. But certainly, those who have experience in the field should be involved in developing a plan for precisely how a plan to do this would be implemented. And before a plan is put in place, it should be carefully tested and evaluated, perhaps in 15 or 20 offices around the country. Although the issues that need to be addressed is uh, what the proposal would require in terms of additional funding, or among the issues that should be addressed, is what the proposal would require in terms of additional funding, hiring, and training. The role of the PrEP that they propose needs to be defined precisely uh, and since this proposal specifies that the PrEP should be part of the Office of General Counsel rather than the hearing office, it raises the issue of who will oversee the work of the PrEP in each hearing office and what would be the relationship of the PrEP to the judge. Questions such as these are important to the efficient and effective operation of this proposed new configuration of the hearing procedure. The paper by the experts from the National Institutes of Health emphasizes the value of enhancing decisions for purposes of the CDR process, but they make clear that their detailed and carefully considered proposals for change in SSA's data infrastructure and review process would strengthen decision-making at all levels, an important enhancement to the disability decision process, which I fully support. By improving the CDR process, as the authors of this paper propose, SSA would also promote the movement of disabled individuals into employment, 
a subject which is currently of great interest to a number of members of Congress, as well as many of you here today. I would suggest that SSA could also develop a program to provide employment assistance to those who are expected to be or who are terminated through the CDR process. In addition, this would be an appropriate time to amend the budget process to provide that savings from performing CDRs be allocated to SSA on an annual basis to be used to cover CDR and related administrative costs. These papers raise many other issues and there is no time to discuss them all. And you will forgive me, I hope, if I take a few moments to raise an issue that I consider to be of the highest priority and which so far has not been discussed. After consulting with many of the agency's ablest DDS and hearing office experts over the years, I am convinced that the most valuable improvement the agency could make is to improve disability program policy. Social Security's disability definition is inherently difficult to implement, and particularly in the last 30 years or so, as SSA's regulations have changed to reflect changes in the law and court decisions, decision makers have had to face new challenges in implementing them. When I was working as a disability advisor to the commissioner some years ago, and after extensive study and discussion among agency experts, we found broad agreement that there were many areas in which disability policy should be clarified. Regulatory language and operational procedures should be improved and made less confusing and subjective. In order to accomplish this objective, we proposed to create a new policy body. We refer to it as a decision review board. I think that a variation of this proposal should be considered now. For example, I think commissioners should be directed to appoint a new review body composed of outstanding and experienced employees, representatives of DDSs, ALJs, administrative appeals judges, and attorneys in the Office of General Counsel who together will report directly to the commissioner. They should serve on a rotational basis with terms of two to three years or more in order to have time to consider and address the issues that are causing inconsistency and error throughout the system. The board should be charged with identifying issues that impede consistent and accurate adjudication and recommending changes directly to the commissioner that will result in greater consistency, accuracy, and fairness in decision making. Claimants should be able to expect fair treatment regardless of where they live or the nature of their disability. A study of past efforts that went into developing this review proposal should prove helpful in devising a new one. I think this high-level body should work closely with the commissioner to be the agency's prime source of program policy advice. This focus on improving policy and its implementation by staff needs to be led by strong leaders throughout the agency. I endorse a suggestion that has been made that the commissioner appoint an experienced administrative law judge who will be a strong leader to head up the reform process. This would, I believe, result in significant improvement in the quality of the disability process. Now I would like to ask our authors to take one or two minutes to respond to my comments and to add additional comments from their seats, after which we will open the floor for questions. Can I go first? Yes, please. Yeah. Am I on? Am I on? Good. Okay. In the past, there's been questions about funding. Where are the people for the PrEP P going to be, where are they going to come from? How are they going to their salaries, to position description, all that? And those are, in fact, valid concerns. From my perspective, if you look at hearing offices, hearing offices have large staff of what's called decision writers. They can be attorneys. They can be paralegals. We have a lot of talented people out there, paralegals, attorneys, who are well-versed in regulations and that kind of thing. So it just seems to me that what's going to happen when you have somebody there as a prep P, an advocate for the system, if you will, the administration of justice, if in fact a case needs to be resolved before it comes to a formal hearing, I'll give you a perfect example, and I've, I've cited this example before, true case. Lady has breast cancer, diagnosed uh, and applies for disability benefits under the recommendation of a physician, 
and the DDS turns her down six months into the process, okay, the 12-month period. It hasn't existed for 12 continuous months. I hear this case a little over two years later where she's had a double mastectomy. She has lymphoma, not lymphoma, but she had, the cancer has metastasized. She's disabled. She's been disabled. There was no one that that person could go to or her representative and say, look what's happened. I'm now in my you know, 12th month, my 18th month of treatment. I can't work. And this person had a strong work background. I see that as being the prep P. Now, where do you get these people from? You got attorneys out there who are looking for career tracks, looking for trial uh, hearing experience. These folks can be the intermediaries to deal with people who have meritorious cases that are bogged down in the system, and that's part of the problem also because of the backlog. You've got all these cases that are pending. Some are probably very meritorious, some are not, but it's hard to get to them because we try to hold the hearings and schedule the hearings as they come into the office. So I can see a prep P with formal rules, moving a case along, bringing a case into in front of a judge with the representative and say, judge, this is the case of so-and-so. We stipulated here are the facts. We are recommending that there be a reversal as of such a state for the following reason. I, as a judge, and this is not an unusual thing, can ask the prevailing party, either the prep P or the uh, representative, prepare the order. Here's my finding of facts. One, two, three, four, five, six. You give me the order. That takes the burden off of somebody in the office writing the order. It gives the burden back to the representative of their prevailing party. They can probably have an order to me in one or two days. I can look at it, sign off on it, and the case will be moved. Now, that's sort of a, a summation of my vision about this. And the funding, you've got people on board already that are, are paid uh, employees, the attorneys. They want to become uh, a prep P and be an advocate for Social Security. That's fine. If it's necessary to go to a hearing, a judge can ask for a stipulation of facts. What are the issues in this case? How long is it going to take? Do you want an ME there? Do you want a VE there? Just like you do in a regular trial court. You'd be surprised how many judges out there with the backgrounds that we have know how to handle the docket and how to move cases and get them through and send out expectations to the parties as to what's needed. So that's more than you want to know, Margaret. But no. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. John? Um, I thought what you said, uh, your suggestions with respect to my proposal, I, I thought were, were terrific. Uh, I, should, I should incorporate those that, that aren't there already. I, I did something of an abbreviation. I had uh, also uh, recommended training of staff, uh, training of experts, better rationales, I think was included as part of the yes. prototype, but should be uh, expressed. I had not included full use of agency feedback. Sounds like a great idea. I can only amplify on your recommendation for training of staff in as much as I think what one finds and one of the problems in looking at the adjudicative system, one of the major critiques is a sense of inconsistency among the different levels between the ALJ stage and the state, uh, the DDS uh, stages. In part, it almost seems as if they're applying different different sources of law, uh, utilizing different uh, types of evidence, and I think training so that there's a more holistic and more consistent application of law and the pursuit of evidence would be very valuable. I mean, just some anecdotal examples of that. I think the, the, the rules on evaluation of, of uh, impairment symptomology, medical evidence, and the vocational decisions not which cannot be uh, made simply using the uh, medical vocational grid regulations seem to get handled uh, in quite different ways from the DDS stages, the initial uh, and reconsideration stages to the hearing stage. And I think training of staff to try to make that more consistent, I think, is a, a very valuable and important uh, development. Thank you. Alex? Um, uh, yes. I. Um I would like to make a comment or more an encouragement um, to people thinking about policy who might not be inclined to think about technology or just um, directed to the IT department, um, that um, technology can really help in setting uh, consistent, accurate decisions and checking errors. And I see um, interactions between the proposals we worked on and um, some of uh, the other work I've heard about today 
And just to mention um, the, what the previous two speakers addressed as an example, um, John addressed um, the issues in case development. Um, the use of an instrument like the FAB could allow for a systematic way to address all the activities that um, claimants might not be able to do and then go about um, in an organized fashion to get evidence supporting each of those um, uh, impairments that might be identified. And then going back um, to your comment about how the electronic folder is disorganized and hard to read, um, having that kind of case development to be able to link the medical evidence and allow, um, uh, allow adjudicators to um, find the relevant pieces of information quickly to search the record and um, to use all of these issues to track where errors and inconsistencies come from. Um, so uh, now hopefully as people are thinking about changes to policy, they will consider technology and the role it can play. Thank you. Uh, now I think we turn to questions from the floor. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Have a mic here. I just want to re-emphasize the the need for training because what's generally happening is that we have people training people in their office on what they did to do. We have, though, a population of federal employees who are hitting that 30-year mark where they're retiring, and they have been passing on old skills when we have new technologies and new techniques to new folks who can maneuver more easily in a data-driven system. But we're also losing that experiential knowledge. And a lot of the stuff about what is appropriate, what is not a disability, is hand is passed from person to person, not really built into the formal procedures. And so it is critically important, while you still have the experience, to set up a formal training process so that you can benefit from the consistency. And I think your idea of bringing those people together to come up with that curriculum, to come up with that technique, and then setting up a training program that is formalized and, and utilizes the latest techniques is critical. Mark Warshawski, I have a question for Alex. Uh, do you know whether to implement your suggestions any changes in law or regulation are required? Um, well, um, I, I know there are changes in law that are required to start uh, using instruments such as the FAB and using predictive analytic models. Um, I'm not sure how those laws would be devised. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but I, I think there are um, various um, legal changes that um, could facilitate the development of these methods and their um, faster adoption. I don't think any laws would be used. No, no statutes. Regs, maybe. Thank you. Back here. <laughs> uh, Romina Baccia, this is a question for Alex. During your research, were you able to access data from the Social Security Administration as to how beneficiaries are currently categorized in the medical diaries? And um, at times, uh, administrative law judges want to make a recommendation based on the cases they hear and say, this person needs 12 to 18 months of recovery because they have a broken leg, but after that they should be reviewed. Would the system be able to integrate that kind of on the ground information that an administrative law judge might be able to make in a hearing? Um, sure, so um, I think with the appropriate um, IT infrastructure, uh, this information from both um, DDS adjudicators and also um, administrative law judges could be integrated in the process and various sources of information could be used to weigh in on the decision. 
Um, the, the problem with the current medical diary designation is that besides a very small percentage of people who are expected to improve, most of the beneficiaries are uh, lumped in the medical um, improvement possible category because it's really hard to predict this. And um, adding additional sources of information along the way, in addition to um, human uh, judgment and opinion and experience, um, would allow for all the various pieces of information to come together and for decisions to be made based on um, information. Uh, Bill Taylor, this question for Dale. Dale, you talked about the role of the pre-prep in facilitating identification of cases that could be potentially allowed without a hearing or perhaps favorable findings could be stipulated. Can, have you talked, thought about how, how the pre-prep would uh, function in an actual full hearing that potentially could end up as a denial, particularly where the claimant is not represented? When you have when you have an unrepresented claimant, it would be a different situation than a represented claimant because Social Security, judges, everyone that works for the agency, we have a real responsibility to make sure people who are not represented uh, have a full and fair hearing, that their record is developed, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, uh, with regard to having a hearing, when the hearing is scheduled and a claimant shows up who is unrepresented and you've got a pre prep P there, one of the things I would envision, first of all, is finding out whether the prep P can vouch that the record is completely developed, up to date, we know that we have all the information in there prior to holding a hearing, which I didn't mention a moment ago, that's something else that perhaps some of this would be taken off of the staff because that's a real problem we have in cases. We schedule cases 60 to 90 days out, sometime longer than that now, and we still go into hearings and the record's not developed. It's missing records, which means the case goes in a post-development status, which adds to the processing time. So the prep P would be the one who would hopefully advocate, in a sense, for the claimant who is unrepresented to ensure that record is complete at the time we have a hearing. Have I responded to your concern in that regard? Okay. Okay, when the claimant is represented, once again, what I envision with the PrEP-P, first of all, the PrEP-P is going to be communicating with the, uh, with the representative, or the representative should be communicating with the uh, uh, PrEP-P, and they're going to tell the judge this case is ready for hearing, and they're basically going to say the evidence is there, or if there's any missing evidence, it's within, what, 14 days of the hearing or something, uh, something that's come up at the last minute that we can't get the records. Otherwise, we will have a hearing, and the representative with the claimant will appear, and uh, hopefully before the hearing, if the judge asks for them to stipulate any facts in the case, what are the issues in the case, is it an onset date, is it the nature of the disability, those kinds of things. And also, as I said, you know, the parties can say, we want a vocational expert, we want a medical expert who's an orthopedist or a, a psychologist or what have you. So I see that as taking a burden, in a sense, off the judge and to some extent off the, you know, the support staff as far as getting that record, uh, I mean, that case ready for a hearing and moving it along. One follow-up, Bill. Will the prep be questioned? Oh, uh, yes, yes. And, the pre and here's the other thing. Uh, Senator Hatch has mentioned it. It's been mentioned before. We're concerned about fraud of the system. We're concerned about judges' decisions. By having a prep P there, if a judge is not uh, issuing a decision that is supported by the record, then the prep P will have that authority to appeal that decision and say, what is this? You know, and, can, and submit it to the appeals council and say, we disagree with this decision of the judge. Yes. Okay. If that happens, is it the same standard that the appeals council will only take a limited number of cases that are I, well, if, assuming the Appeals Council revises its focus, as we are recommending, then it would be the same burden on the prep P who's advocating for the agency as it would be for the representative attorney who's representing the claimant. Yes, it would be the same standard. Uh, I choked on the idea that the criteria for medical improvement expected are dated in the mid-1990s. 
And it seems to me that whatever the fundamental cause is of SSA's turgid updating of stuff needs to be addressed as part of this. So when you were talking about your policy group that you would suggest be advising the administrator or whoever it is, that seems to have, a, it needs to be, a, Social Security needs to be mandated to keep up with the times and, as, as ex, and stop using excuses for using old information. We have a question over here. Question for uh, Dale and Alex. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the UK uses an independent medical assessor when uh, uh, when developing a case. What what's your opinion as to the value of having an independent medical assessment um, in as an as an adjunct to the, uh, the 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 case preparation? In New York City, they do this. You have an independent medical assessment when welfare recipients say they can't go to work and it costs about uh, $400 per, per uh, assessment. Not, not, excuse me, not knowing the entire uh, process in UK or even New York, I don't have an opinion one way or the other because I really don't know what their role would be because, uh, you know, presumably now with our initial consideration and reconsideration, we're having people that are trying to be open and and looking at it, uh, even though they're employed, uh, one by the state agency, the other by Social Security. So I, I'm sorry, I don't have really a strong opinion one way or the other. Yes, I'm also not familiar with, with the pro uh, program you mentioned. Um, I know that there are other ways to assess functioning um, that are extremely um, cost prohibitive. Um, the, the FAB instrument tried to um, come up with a way to assess um, patients through self-report, but um, assess them quickly and cost-effectively, and then um, adding evidence to the, uh, the self-report. Um, so I'm not sure um, if more, more medical assessments, they, they sound like they could be more accurate, but the cost probably needs to play into it. Dave Stapleton. So earlier I had, uh, in, in our proposal, we had recommended changing the uh, definition of disability in the Social Security Act to uh, take greater account of contextual factors and also the availability of uh, supports in the environment that could help a person return to work. So, you know, and that was part of our proposal which had this whole front end which really changed the determination process. But you can also do that with the current determination process. And so I would like to ask each of you if, if you were to change that definition of the law, which I think most people would agree is a more realistic conceptual definition of disability, could you handle that definition in the current adjudicative process? And also, how would your specific proposals affect the ability of the adjudicative process to handle that idea? Can, can you can you tell me what the definition you're referring to? We, we've heard well, the definition in the statute which, you know, it, it's you know, a, a medically determinable condition, long-lasting, uh, but then also there's the vocational factors involved, right? And, and so, so that's basically what's guiding the criteria that, that uh, all the adjudicators are using. Um, there are, of course, very specific ways and regulations and rules you all have, to, but they're trying to capture that idea. And what I'm saying is, Suppose we look at other contextual factors that are not in the law now, but that could be in the law and are more consistent with our understanding of disability today, which says, you know, the kind of health care you're getting, uh, the rehabilitation care that's available to you, availability of assistive technology, all those things matter. But in general, we're not taking them into account in the adjudicative process today. And so the question is, and, you know, I know GAO has been asking this question for a long time, could the adjudicative process actually take all those other factors into account? Well, and then how would your specific proposals assist or not assist in that process? I, I would think if the Social Security Administration made these factors policies in their definition of disability, then judges would be obliged to apply them in, ju in adjudicating the uh, decisions. Is that? I, 
I'd have to say it, depend, it depends on the factors. I mean, there are factors that are not in the regulations or in the act. You know, the, the ability to get to and from a job, for example, is a contextual factor. But I think if uh, a record were presented before an administrative law judge on that, uh, on that contextual fact, uh, it may very well lead to a, uh, a favorable decision. It could be appropriately proven. I think that the same may hold true with many of the other contextual factors that you want to add into the, 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 the process, uh, but it would depend on assessment of those factors. One last question. Question for John. Um, did you look at um, Commissioner Barnhard's effort to redesign the disability system? I mean, she focused obviously on the second level review and trying to achieve many of the same things that you described, but achieve it at that level. I did. You mean the uh, um, federal reconsideration? Right, right. The, the federal, uh, what I thought is that largely uh, the, the critique of it was really that it was going to replicate the problems with reconsideration. It was going to produce another layer that didn't meaningfully change the results of the initial. And I think that had something to do with why it was uh, abandoned from my review of the literature on that, on that step. So yes, and I, I've included that in, in my paper. That is the last question. Thank you very much. Thank our panelists for their good presentations. And thank you for your good questions. <laughs>